Okay, finally going home. Two weddings and cocktails and dinner. I've been playing for, I don't know, six hours today. My back is killing me. Um, but in the last video, I brought up a point that someone was astute enough to catch. Uh, where I talked about the New Covenant a little bit. And I had to go do my research a little bit during the break. I started to panic. Had I gotten into heresy? You have to understand, this is territory. It's not like I sit here and study this stuff all the time. Most of the things I say, I don't even know I remember. But while I'm talking, it seems like things come to mind. And so I just go with what I think is the flow. And sometimes say things that surprise me. And in this case, I thought, well, maybe I shouldn't have brought that up. Because it'll bring up questions, you know, that could be endless. But regarding the New Covenant, the New Covenant goes with the Old Covenant. When the Bible talks about the Old Covenant, it's not talking about the covenant made with Abraham. It's talking about the covenant made with Moses, uh, where Moses sprinkled the blood on the people and the book and the tabernacle and brought the law out. And that was a covenant, according to Galatians, that was added because of transgressions that did not nullify the covenants God made with Abraham, which were unconditional. And really it was God put Abraham to sleep and the furnace and the lamp, the torch passed through the cut pieces for that covenant, the father and the son. That was a covenant made in the triune God. And Galatians reveals that the covenant was made with Christ, who is the seed that was promised. And the promise uh, to Abraham that he would be, that a seed would be multiplied and that he would inherit the land and everything was ultimately made with Christ, his seed, who is the seed of Abraham and the seed of David. So he has the land and the kingdom and the unlimited supply of the spirit. That was all made by covenant with Abraham's seed. And that covenant was cut while Abraham was asleep. Okay. And while he was asleep, that means he couldn't mess it up if he tried. He has absolutely zero responsibility in this matter. This is something God was going to do. And it's based on God's holy promise with himself. And Hebrews talks about how God could not swear by anyone greater, so he swore by himself. And it talks about by two immutable witnesses, um, the, the Father and the Son, you know, that, that, that this is a secure promise. And he did that for our sake. And he made an oath. So it was a serious deal, solemnly swearing that your seed will possess this land, so be it unto me. And that, and in that sense, Jesus became the surety um, of the covenant. Okay, so anyway, that's the covenant God made with Abraham. Well, the law was given 400 years later, and it says it was given because of transgression. It was added for transgressions. Um, until the time that the seed to whom the promises were made would come, which is Christ. And then God says, or Paul says that Christ came uh, in the fullness of times, born under the law to redeem, uh, to redeem those under the law from the curse of the law. The law was a temporary, it was a covenant, but it was temporary, and it had a priesthood with it, the Levitical priesthood and the tabernacle, and all of those things were temporary, because those sacrifices could not make atonement for sin or purge the consciousness of the sacrificers who continually offered these sacrifices, which was just a reminder of sins, and a promise that it would be once re eventually resolved. So that whole system is the old covenant. 
the sacrificial system, the Levitical system, and the uh, law, which describe the will of God, not for the purpose of them keeping it, but to show them that they could, so that they could be shut up in hope unto the faith that it would eventually be revealed through Christ when he came, the seed of Abraham. Okay? So, Paul says in Galatians that that covenant, the temporary covenant, could not add conditions to the covenant God made with Abraham or make it of no effect. So their inheritance is not contingent on whether they keep Moses' covenant. They can be disciplined because they failed to keep that covenant, and they still need to be of faith. They still need to believe in the promise to the seed. And really, anyone who was sensitive to the law and had a sensitive conscience and a broken and contrite heart knew that they couldn't be justified by the law. They had to be justified by faith. So there was always still justification by faith, even under the covenant that God made you know, through Moses. And that is what is called the Old Covenant. The covenant with Abraham is not the Old Covenant. The covenant through Moses is the Old Covenant that's passing away, that's written on tablets of stone. Okay, so now there's a promise in Jeremiah and Ezekiel with the house of Judah, the house of Jacob, or the house of Israel, and the house of Judah of a new covenant. Because they broke the old one. Their whole history is of them breaking that covenant. But that did not make them not heirs. That's really important to understand for people who say, well, they didn't keep, you know, they didn't keep the law, so they're done. No. They're still heirs according to the promise that they have the faith, even if they completely wandered under the covenant with Moses. I'm talking about them as a nation. And so God, they, that nation will have, still has a destiny that cannot be revoked. And that destiny has to do has the need of a new covenant. And in that new covenant, they'll take away the heart of stone, give them the heart of flesh, give them a new spirit, and put his spirit in them, and write his laws in their inward parts, in their minds and in their hearts, so that they will not forsake his way. And they will, so that it is an outpouring of the spirit that is similar to what we have today as New Testament believers. But I think it's different because the new covenant um, is still related to law and it's related to the kingdom and it's related to like in the kingdom. Did you know there's going to be sacrifices in the kingdom? There's a third temple, which we know is the Antichrist, but there will be the temple of the Lord raised up in Israel during the time of the millennium and the nations will be expected to do memorial sacrifices I think they're just burnt offerings, not sin offerings the Lord already took care of that but these sacrifices are a memorial and a remembrance and a reminder of what he did to purchase and if they don't offer these, if they don't come up for these there will be feasts and everything if they don't come up for these, the nations they'll be judged without rain and stuff like that you can look at all this in the Old Testament uh, the conditions of the millennium might surprise you. However, they're still under grace. I don't want to say that they're under the law. But the new covenant is better. It's based on better promises. Because the old covenant they couldn't keep. But the new covenant they will because they will be remade. Now, if you say we're under that, then how come we don't walk in the will of God all the time? You know? that He says... I, I'll write my laws in your heart and in your mind and you'll keep them and you won't break the covenant and I'll cause you to walk in my ways. But for the church, we have something a little different because our flesh is unruly and we can backslide and all kinds of stuff and still be saved. So can they, but I, I don't believe backsliding will be an issue under the blessing of the new covenant for Israel. It is for a people who are at home in their olive uh, tree as natural branches that have been grafted back in and now have the spirit, whereas before they didn't. Now, there's two aspects of the spirit revealed in the Bible. There's the spirit that used to come on people in the Old Testament to enable them 
to do the will of God and do supernatural exploits. And then there is the spirit of Jesus Christ, the spirit of life, that was not yet given because Jesus had not yet been glorified in John 7, but he said it would become in you rivers flowing out of your innermost being. And Paul talks much about this spirit that is, I've talked about it before, the compound spirit that has the resurrection, the humanity, the human virtues, the divine attributes, and the death with its effectiveness of Christ compounded into it so that when we drink of the spirit, we have his death being applied to our members, which is why it says by the spirit you can mortify the deeds of the flesh, and we have life renewing our inner man and our mind. And that is something, that is the law of the spirit of life which is in Christ Jesus. That is not the law of the new covenant. It's something different. It's of resurrection. It's uh, for the new creation, for the body of Christ. And it secures our glorification. That law is working in us to eventually, it will, in the day, saturate our bodies, clothe us with life, and make us incorruptible, and conform us to the image of the Son as glorified children of God. That is something entirely different and higher. Now, there's the New Testament, or the New Covenant, which is a contrast to the Old Covenant, and when Jesus shed his blood or when, when he talked about shedding his blood in the upper room when he did the Lord's Supper he talked about the new covenant for the remission of sins and that was really for Israel we weren't even mentioned yet and here's the thing you cannot highly enough extol the ministry of Christ and distinguish it from everything before I'm sorry the ministry of Paul the more I understand Paul, the Pauline position, that he is really the heavenly ambassador. He's the apostle from heaven in a way. The earthly apostles from Jerusalem were with Jesus in his earthly ministry and sent out by him. But Paul was, his vision of Christ was the glorified Christ identified with his body and said, why do you persecute me? when he was talking about his members, and he was the ascended Christ from heaven, and the body of truth he gave Paul was heavenly revelation. Heavenly. Everything that happened after Christ ascended to heaven and sprinkled his blood on the propitiation and uh, sent forth his spirit to make the body of Christ, and then there's all these new truths that come out with Paul related to the body of Christ that were never even hinted at in human history. They're not part of Israel's program. They're not part of the kingdom. They're not part of the prophetic program. They are mysteries hidden in God's heart from eternity past for a people that he foreknew in Christ. He knew them because in eternity he already has a history with us. We are members of the body of Christ. I don't think we can overemphasize how special that is. That God sees us in Christ and Christ in us and sees us as members of Christ. And when he considers his son, he considers us. From eternity past, he knew us. This is different than the election of Israel in time with their kingdom. And they are a vehicle so that Christ could come. But the real hidden reason why Christ came was for the church. And yes, he will honor and bless Israel and eventually bring them to glory. But his first purpose, his eternal purpose, the good pleasure of the Father's will, the masterpiece of God, the new creation for which the entire universe was created to bring forth, is the church as the body of Christ, which Paul calls his fullness. It is the fullness of God. It is the habitation of God. It's You cannot underestimate how high and privileged of a position we have and how special we are to the heart of God. We don't. We have been under so much bad teaching that's been a mixture of law and grace. Even when we talk about these kind of things, 
that we think God doesn't like us but begrudgingly has to forgive us because Jesus died and we believed. No, he saw you as one of Christ's members. He saw you as a member of the body of Christ and Christ saw you at, he doesn't hate his own flesh but loves, cherishes, and nourishes his own flesh. We're bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. We are his bride, his spouse, his counterpart. We are his very self. We are the new man, the new creation of God, the body of Christ. I, and yes, it had to be hidden because if the princes of this world had known what God was going to bring forth through the death and resurrection of Christ, they wouldn't have allowed him to be crucified. <coughs> so God hid all this truth and didn't reveal it to Paul. And with him, there's something called the fellowship of the mystery. The economy of the mystery, the administration of the mystery, the God's economy to create this new thing. That's what Ephesians is all about. It's the highest vision in the whole Bible. And very few of us even really get a glimpse into it. We kind of talk about it, but it's hard to get our heart around it. And this is higher than the old of the new covenant. The new covenant replaced the old covenant. We are heirs of Abraham, not because we're related to Abraham, <coughs> but because we've been baptized into Christ, clothed with Christ, and Christ is the seed to whom the promises were made. So because we are one with Christ, we are therefore Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. We don't have anything to do with the old covenant that God made with Israel. That was 400 years later. It was temporary. It was for transgressions. It's related to their destiny and their priesthood. And the new covenant that God made with them was that he will give them in the millennium was to replace the old. Not replace the covenant that God made with Abraham, which we're heirs of, but to replace the covenant God made through Moses, which we have nothing to do with. That was only given to Israel. That's their unique privilege, to have the oracles of God and to have the tabernacle and all that. And in the new, in the kingdom, under the new covenant, they will serve as priests and have their kingdom with a temple and a proper memorial and their king, Jesus Christ and their prince David with them. It'll be glorious, but it still won't be anything like what we are. We are the, the heirs with Christ, heirs of God, heirs of the universe. And uh, uh, Paul said, or no, Jesus said, one thing he said, Remember what he said about John the Baptist? Of men born of women, there's been none greater. None greater than John the Baptist. Of any Solomon, Adam, Daniel, John the Baptist was the greatest of them all. Nevertheless, I tell you, he who is least in the kingdom of heaven will be greater than he. So he's bringing in a new order of things. And if that was true of them, how much more of the glorified children of God who have been conformed to the image of Christ by the law of the spirit of life, by his resurrected life in their members, giving life to their body and, and, and clothing the body of their humiliation, transfiguring it to be like the body of Christ's glory by the working of the power of God through which he's able to subject all things to himself, which is the very resurrection power of Christ, which is exceeding abundantly beyond all that we can ask or think. Do a search and a work uh, on the working of God's power of resurrection in us. That was not even hinted at in the new covenant. This is something higher. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is not the same thing as the law written in your heart and your mind, the Ten Commandments, so that you'll do my will. This is the resurrected life of Christ dispensed as the Spirit to saturate you with him and bring you into glory as a child of God, just like Christ, where the only difference between you and him is that he was from eternity past and you had a beginning in time. And we just can't even imagine what we're going to be like. When we see him, we will be as he is because we will be, um, we will be like him because we'll see him as he is. Israel won't have that. In, at least in the kingdom. They're not going to be transfigured. I'm talking about natural Israel, the heirs of Abraham, that will go through the tribulation and Jesus will come and save them from their enemies. And then they will go through and populate the New uh, Testament 
or, I'm sorry, the kingdom, but um, Zechariah says that he will pour out upon them the spirit of grace and supplications, and they'll see me whom they've pierced. So there will be a spirit of grace and supplication. There will be a spirit, the spirit of the new covenant will come to them. They'll be renewed and re renewed. I don't know if they'll be regenerated. I don't see them as members of the body of Christ. That is for this age. And you got to you say, well, that's not fair. Well, think about it. The ones who come to believe in the tribulation rejected the word of grace during the time it was offered. They could have been members of the body of Christ. They could have had a higher destiny. So there is a difference in privilege. If you get saved in this age, blessed are those who, who, who have not seen yet believe. They're going to get saved and see him. And that it's just different. It's still a blessing, but there's a special prize. And not only that, but God knew us from eternity past. He knows you from eternity past if you're a member of the body of Christ. In a way that he doesn't say that about... He doesn't say that from the foundation... Chosen in him from the foundation of the world. And when was the grace given to you? The grace was given to you in Christ before the world began. Your inheritance was given to you in Christ before the world began. It was already before God created anything. God had you in mind. And the reason he created the heavens and the earth was so that he could have you in it, the church. There's a book by uh, Billingham was his name. And it was called Destined for the Throne. And it really changed my view of the church many years ago. He showed that the, ch that the church, based on Ephesians, is the eternal purpose of God. The eternal purpose of God is before his work in time, before anything. There was this mystery hidden in his heart, the real reason why he did it all. It was to bring about a group of people from the resurrection Christ. And we're different. I mean, not just negatively. You, you look at salvation. We look at salvation in terms of sin. But there's a wholly positive side to salvation. Like in John, it says Jesus was the Lamb of God and he was the bronze serpent. Those two things are related to sin with respect to his death. But he was also the grain of wheat. The grain of wheat is wholly positive. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it comes up and bears much fruit. What is that? That is Christ's humanity as a shell being broken open so that the divine life within him can be released and multiplied to bring about a harvest, a multiplication of himself. And when God put Adam to sleep as a type of Christ, it was so that he could bring a companion out from his side, rep represented by that bone which typifies the resurrection of Christ, the incorruptible life, that rib, and God builded a woman just like he builds the church for Adam to be his counterpart. God was, Adam was not complete until he had his counterpart. And that was ordained as a pattern for Christ. See, Adam hadn't sinned, but God put him to sleep and took a bride out of his side. That's without, that is a salvation that has nothing to do with sin. And we're so sin conscious because we're so law conscious that we can't even conceive of the fact that God has a salvation in view towards us that has nothing to do with sin. It's strictly because of love because we're his children, and because we're members of the body of Christ, and God wanted to bring us out of his side and produce something out of Christ that is his multiplication and his increase, which is why Paul calls the church the body of Christ, which is his fullness. You know, if I'm just a head, I don't have a fullness to express myself. But if I have a head and a body, I now have a fullness with which to express myself. The body of Christ the church is the fullness of Christ. Just think about that for a while. Think about it. Think about the church as the fullness of Christ. And then you realize how essential all of this was for us. And so that's why, you know, if I say I don't think we're under the new covenant, it sounds heretical until you lift up your eyes and see this kind of vision. Say, no, we're not related to the old covenant. And the new covenant was to replace the old covenant. That was temporary. That was for Israel. And it has nothing to do with the covenant God made with Abraham. It has to do with Moses. God had to do away with that so he could bring in a new covenant so that they could have their kingdom. 
so that they could be the proper kind of people to inherit what God had promised through Abraham related to the land. But we are not really directly heirs of the covenant God made with Abraham by ourselves. We're brought into it because we are in the person who is the true heir, which is Christ. We are Christ. You know, the uh, Corinthians talks about the church, you know, as the body has many members, right? There's the head and there's the many members, and you can't say, oh, I have no need of the eye, I have no idea. Look what he says. He says, so also is the Christ. As the body is one but has many members, so also is the Christ. He doesn't say, so also is the church. He says, so also is the Christ. This is a high, 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 high vision of Christ in his body. And if we really grasped it, we'd have absolutely no fear. We would be completely changed by this kind of vision. And I pray that we do get a, a, vision, a bigger vision of who we are in Christ. Okay, I gotta get going.